Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to round three, or part three, of uh, my three parts uh, reflection on the Mass. And I'm so glad you're able to come here on a, on a hot day outside, but a comfortable day inside. So glad you're here. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, our Father, we gather in your house this evening, in this holy place where your word is spoken and your bread is broken. It is here where we remember into the present your son's sacrifice, and we are nourished in our journey to your kingdom. Help us to be enriched tonight in our understanding of the great sacrament of the Mass, so that when we come together at Jesus' invitation to do this in memory of me, we will appreciate all the more the great gift we have been given. And so we make this prayer to you, Father, in the name of Jesus, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A few months ago, I've, when, I don't know when I did this first one, we talked on uh, the real presence. And we we're talking about the fact that so many of our fellow Catholics, 70% of them don't believe that the bread becomes the actual presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. It's just a sign or a symbol. We talked about that. And last time we met, I, we, I talked and reflected on how the Mass represents or makes present the, the, the Jesus' death on the cross, how, that's, how, we, how it's remembered into the now. It's brought from Calvary into our church. And if you missed any of those talks, you probably catch them um, um, online on the parish website. Today I want to, uh, this evening I want to talk about the kind of the, the what we do and, 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 and why we do it at Mass. And let me just begin by saying, you know, when we come to church on Sunday, we Catholics have a very structured and a very organized way of celebrating Mass. In fact, it's so organized that, you know, if you went to any church in any part of the world, you would see the same thing. You may not understand the language, but you would know what was going on. And we've had a long time to develop and standardize our celebration of the Mass, our celebration of the Eucharist. But you know, did, did you ever wonder what it would have been like in the earliest days of our church, before there was a printing press, before they had liturgical books to follow, before there was a developed leadership, before the church was organized in the diocese and parishes, before they were able to standardize things. Well, you know, the earliest description of what we call the Eucharist is found at the end of St. Luke's Gospel. I'm going to read it to you. You've heard this all before. But I ask you to listen again tonight in light of what we're going to talk about. St. Luke says this. He says, Now on that day, the day of the resurrection, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? And he asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Then Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? 
Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, said the blessing, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up, returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord has indeed risen, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Um, That was a bare bones description. Did you notice in that story about the the walk to Emmaus, there was two parts. Jesus is with these two disciples. He shared the scriptures, and then he broke the bread. The sharing the word of God and breaking the bread. And that is how those early Christians, from the very beginning, structured their worship. They gathered to read the word of God and to explain it. And then they they would take bread and wine, say the blessing as Jesus did. This is my body, this is my blood. They'd break the bread, they didn't eat and drink, and they'd go home. In fact, the earliest name for what we call the Mass is the breaking of the bread. That's what they called the mass in the early centuries. It's called the breaking of the bread. People would share God's word and then break the bread together after they recalled what Jesus had done at the Last Supper. In the early days, they would first go to the synagogue and they would join in the reading of the word of God and then they'd go to someone's home and celebrate the Eucharist. St. Justin Martyr was an early Christian writer And he wrote something about the year 150. So this really goes back into the early time of the church, about 150. And he offered a simple at five version of of Catholic theology intended for those who weren't familiar with how Christians worshiped. And and he described what Christians do do when they gather on Sunday. And this is what, this is the earliest description in one sense from a a non-biblical author. He says this. Those who are called brethren are assembled in order that we may offer prayers in common for ourselves, for all the baptized and for all others in every place. Having ended the prayers, we salute one another with a kiss. There is then brought to the presider of the brethren bread and a cup of wine mixed with water, and taking them, he gives praise and glory to the Father of the universe. Through the name of Jesus and of the Holy Spirit, And he offers thanks at considerable length for our being counted worthy to receive these things from his hands. And when the presider has concluded the prayers and the thanksgiving, all the people present express their assent by saying amen. This word amen in the Hebrew language means so be it. And when the presider has given thanks and all the people have expressed their consent, those who are called by us as deacons give to each of those present the bread and the wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving was pronounced. And the deacon carry away a portion to those who are absent. Then he adds this, he says, not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but as Jesus Christ our Savior, who is made flesh by the word of God. So likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the power of his word is the flesh and blood of Jesus, who was made flesh and blood for us. So there's a description, you know, know, maybe just a hundred years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, of what they did. Do you notice the basic elements of what we do today? Early on in our church, 
the worship had already shifted from Saturday to Sunday. Remember, Jews worshipped on Saturday. That was the Sabbath. And, and Christians, they considered themselves Jews. They were Jews who believed in Jesus. So they would go to the synagogue on Saturday, and then they would go home for the breaking of the bread. Well, they got kicked out of the synagogue. So they just did it on Sunday, the day of the resurrection. And when they, when they were kicked out, they took the synagogue service of reading the scriptures and, and, and discussing them and preaching on them, and they attached it to the to the bread of the breaking of the bread service that I just read. And this is what formed the liturgy of the church. And you can easily see that framework in what we do today. What do we do on Sunday? We gather to share the scriptures in the liturgy of the word, and then we move to the altar for the liturgy of the Eucharist. We Catholics have been doing this for 2,000 years. But let me point out something. You know, the, we use the word liturgy a lot. Do you know what the word liturgy means? It's a Greek word and it's a Latin word, lit, liturgia. And it means public work or public worship. That's what the word liturgy means. We work to give public worship to God. Just like those people 2,000 years ago, Catholics down through the centuries, you know, we gather to publicly worship God. You know, the emphasis is on the word public. Please remember that. We come for public worship. The liturgy, the mass, is not a time for private worship or for private praying that we may personally pray at home the way we you know, do at home. We, it's not time to say the rosary. The mass is not a Marian devotion. The, the rosary is a private devotion. It's not, not a time for reading out of a prayer book privately. It's a public prayer. When we gather as a community on Sunday, we come not to do something privately, we come to do something publicly. There's a formal way we pray in public that's deeply rooted in the history and the tradition of our church. As I said, the way we celebrate Mass today looks a, a whole lot like the way it was celebrated in the early, early, early church. They were people who were engaged in what they were doing. They understood why they were doing it as should we understand. Liturgy is not a time to come and sit. It's not a time to come and enjoy you know, the music or to appreciate uh, you know, the church, how the church is decorated or to relish a, 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 a good homily. Not that those things aren't important, but that is not why we come. We come not to get, we come to give. We come to give worship, to give public worship to God. And it takes work to do that. That work is rooted in how our church has prayed from the very beginning. Of course, it's been embellished and it's been formalized and it's been standardized over the centuries. Of course, over the years, things have been added and things have been removed, but its structure has remained the same. What that means is if that someone from the first and, or second century would come to St. Mary's this coming Sunday, they would be surprised by the, the, the size of this building. They would be surprised by how many people are gathered together. But if somehow they understood English, they would know exactly what we're doing. It would all be familiar to them. So what I want to do tonight, as promised, I want to walk through the Mass and look at what we do and why we do it and how it's connected to our tradition. First of all, you know, the, the, you need a, a priest for mass, right? You need a priest for sacraments. The priest serves as, as a presider. He presides. Sometimes he's called the president of the assembly, but he presides. He's the leader of the liturgy. He is ordained to represent Jesus, who's the head of the church. Jesus is the one who speaks praise and he gives honor and glory to his Father in heaven. That's the priest represents Jesus, who is the one who gives praise to his Father, always. But as a human being, the priest also represents the community to which he belongs. And as, as he speaks in the name of the community and through the prayers he offers. So the priest is kind of is the bridge between, the priest represents Jesus and he represents the church. He's ordained from the community to represent God and, and the community. So what happens at the beginning of Mass? 
the, priest begin, the mass begins with the priest and the deacon entering through the community. It doesn't come in through the side door. It comes in through the community. The procession is led by what? Led by the cross. The cross leads the procession. Reminds us that we are all followers of Jesus who leads us to the cross of our salvation. We're reminded that we must take up our cross and follow him. That's how we start our worship. So much is said when we walk down the aisle, following the cross of Christ, the cross of our salvation. Notice that. I mean, that is something as simple as getting into the place is saying something. And as, 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 as the, the priest and the deacon and their sort of walk in, as Mass begins, what do we do? The community's doing. We sing. We sing. Singing has a long history in Christian worship that goes back before the time of Christ. Jews sang when they worshiped God. The Gospels say that Jesus sang when he worshiped his Father. And we sing when we worship as well. We sing loudly and proudly. It's not a time to listen to the music. It's a time to sing the music. It's communal prayer. Prayer it, 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 it can be sung. We should be singing at that time. The priest gets to the front. He acknowledges the, the risen Christ in the tabernacle by genuflecting or bowing. I have some trouble with my foot, so I don't always genuflect. I, but bowing as, as, as the priest and deacon enter the sanctuary. The priest... Uh, and I, sometimes I, I can, sometimes I can't, but priest goes up and kisses the altar, right? That's how it begins. The altar is the focal point in a Catholic church. In any Catholic church in the world that you enter, the altar is the first thing you see. It's always dead center, always, no exceptions. Everything points to the altar, everything radiates from the altar, because it's there that the Eucharist is celebrated. It's there that the sacrifice of the cross is offered. It's there that the bread and wine is transformed, it's changed, it's consecrated into the presence of the risen Christ, the living Lord, the Son of God. And it's from there that we're sent to carry Christ to a waiting world. You know, many altars, uh, if, you, if, you, if you've ever gone on, on vacation at other churches uh, or even into Europe, some, church, some altars are very elaborate, as, as they should be. Uh, our altar here at St. Mary, we have a very wide sanctuary, so our, our altar is very wide, and it's shaped like a what? What does it look like? Like a table. A table on which the, 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 um, the, the Lord's Supper is celebrated. But you know, if you go into old churches, churches, uh, this is kind of a modern church, but a lot of the old churches, um, especially in the first few centuries, um, altars were not very elaborate. Before they began building formal churches, as Mass was celebrated at home, and altars were simply a small wooden table that they'd bring in after they shared the Word of God. They'd sit around, share the Word of God, they'd bring a little table, and they'd do the celebrate Eucharist. But as the, as the church kind of came out of the persecution, you know, around the fourth century, they began to build formal places of worship ded dedicated just to, to Mass and things became more elaborate. Did you ever wonder why some of the churches, the old churches, the altars didn't look so much like a table. They were, they were a solid block, right? Solid rectangle. What did they look like? If you take a solid block of marble, fill that up, pretend this is all one big solid, what, what would it look like? Pardon me? I can't hear you. A tomb, a, a, sarcoph a casket, sarcophagus. In the, in the early days of the church, altars were built over the body of a martyr or a saint. They celebrated mass in the body of someone who was a witness to the, to the, to the faith and a challenge to people to go and do likewise. So there was, a, a, was a, saint, a saintly person or a holy person, they would celebrate mass over his or her body as a reminder of the people this person lived their faith to the death. So should you. So should you. Now, we haven't done that uh, for many centuries, but we have a, a remnant of that practice. Do you know what it is? I can't, I can't hear you. Speak up. In every altar, there is what's called an altar stone. 
It is a piece of, uh, piece of marble, and in it is a relic of a saint. And it's, it's, it's put where the Eucharist is celebrated. It's put right there, and it's part of the altar, and, and, the, and the consecration takes place on the, on the, on the remains of a saint. It's so very small. Um, it's interesting. In fact, I asked Father John, uh, who is the, uh, whose relic do we have in our altar? And he didn't know because uh, somehow the paperwork had been lost from this, when this church was built in the 60s. We don't know who it is, and you can't tell. But let me ask you a question. The, uh, I said the altar stone is always where the bread and wine are placed. Here, here it is. Why is it here? Oh, speak up. Well, you can't see it. You know, what? Give me a practical reason. When this church was built, this was against the wall. When they remodeled it, they should have taken that altar <laughs> and turned it around. But it's probably too heavy, so they just moved it forward. So I think it's a real practical reason, not very, no theology, it's just it was too heavy. So uh, if you want to see the, the, uh, the altar stone uh, after we're done, come and uh, I'll show it to you. So, that's it. When, at some, some celebrations, uh, more festive things, maybe Christmas, Easter, Pentecost, whatever, the priest will incense the altar. You know, we use incense uh, occasionally, not every Sunday. It's more festive thing. This is called a thurible or, or a censer, and in it is... There's a little piece of round charcoal that's, that sits inside here, and they light it up maybe in like 15, 20 minutes before it's needed. And it's brought out, and the charcoal gets very white, it gets very hot. And incense, little grains of incense, are put on it. And when it hits the hot uh, charcoal, it, it, it creates sweet smelling smoke. The, the, the idea is that just as that smoke rises up and then disappears and yet somehow remains present too. You can still smell it. You can't see it. But it's a sign of our prayers that we lift up to God. Our prayer, we lift to God, but still, you know, there's still part of us. And, just, and also it's a sign of the presence of God. We, you know, he, God. we don't see God, but God is still with us. So it's kind of a multi-purpose um, uh, liturgical action. But the priest may, will take the thurible and incense the altar incense the cross and and if it's used at the offertory he'll incense the people as well so uh, if you want to if you want to see any of this stuff when we're done please come up and, and take a look at it so the priest comes up he he uh, he kisses the altar at a sign of reverence this is where the Eucharist is celebrated and then he goes to the chair to the presider's chair and the sign of the cross we st we, we mark ourselves with the name of God. We bless ourselves, we clothe ourselves with God's identity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The sign of the cross has been around since the early stage of the days of the church. And we make it deliberately. You know, we don't, this is, uh, uh, no, don't do that. The sign of the, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's the cross of our salvation, our redemption. Make it deliberately. Make it a prayer. It's a physical prayer. Then the priest greets the congregation. And he greets the congregation with a greeting from St. Paul's letters. You know, almost all of St. Paul's letters begin with something like, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. That's the official greeting for Mass. Often it's just shorted, shortened to be, the Lord be with you. It's just a shorter version of that Trinitarian greeting. In fact, we say the Lord be with you, how many times do we say it during Mass? Four. We say it at the beginning. We say it at the beginning of the Gospel. We say it at the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer. And we say it at the end of Mass. It's, it's, it's the official greeting. So after the priest has greeted everybody, we, we have what's called the penitential rite. We offer God prop, you know, to offer God proper worship, we need to be aware of how unworthy we are to do what we're about to do. So what do we do? We acknowledge our sins, and we ask for God's mercy. 
So the priest says, let us, something like, let us call to mind our sins. And then there's a, a, a short pause of silence. You're supposed to be doing something. We are sinners in deep need of God's forgiveness. So we should, we should be just thinking that we're unworthy to do this and how blessed we are to do it. Then the deacon, or if there's a deacon or the priest, the deacon would offer three invocations that praise God and ask for the Lord's mercy. So you, the deacon may say, you, Lord, you have, you have come to heal the contrite. He says, Lord, have mercy. We say, Lord, have mercy. You intercede for us at the right hand of the Father. Christ, have mercy. Christ. So it's, it's a little praise of God and then asking for, for mercy for our sins. Then we do the Gloria. You know, the Gloria is the oldest hymn we have in the liturgy. It goes back to the, the 300s. Go back to, the, you know, 1,700 years ago. That, it goes back to the 300s, and it's rooted in St. Luke's infancy narrative. Remember where the angels announce the birth of the Son of God to the, to the shepherds with a hymn of glory in the night sky? They sang, glory to God in the highest. And that's what we do in the Gloria. Now, it's been elaborated on. It's been built into a, into a poetic hymn, which we, which we sing. We don't listen to the Gloria. It's a prayer. It's a biblical prayer. So we sing the Gloria. You don't praise God by listening to someone else praise God. So when the glory is there, you can't just stay away. It's a prayer. So you join in that prayer, not listening to the person next to you do it. You sing. Even if you can't sing, I always say, God gave you that voice, you give it back to him. Now, it doesn't matter. You're not asked to join the choir. You're asked to, to sing, praise God with the voice he gave you. Then comes the opening prayer. The priest says, let us pray. The short pause, so you should just say a little prayer at that time as, as you're getting, getting the book ready to say the prayer. The opening prayer is a prayer of praise. Now, there's two parts. Of the op- listen to every opening prayer. A little prayer of praise that leads into a petition. For example, this coming Sunday, this is what we're going to say. The priest will say, O oh God, who through the grace of adoption shows us to be children of light, praising God for that. Therefore, grant that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. So all the opening prayers have two parts, praising God for something, then asking God for something. That's the opening prayer. And we end the prayer by saying, through Christ our Lord, or through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. All Christian prayers end that way. They all end through Christ our Lord. You, we only can approach God because God approached us. Jesus came to us that we might come to God. So we always pray in the name of Jesus. If you offer a prayer and you don't end through Christ our Lord or something like that, I mean, it's a... a Nice prayer, not necessarily Christian. Could be a good Jewish prayer. Christians pray through Christ. Christians pray through the name of, through the presence of, and the power of Jesus. So anytime you say a prayer, whether it's whatever, it's, it's through Christ, it's through Jesus. We only can approach God through the Son of God who came to us. You notice the prayer, the posture, the prayer, the, the, the priest assumes it's called the oran's position. Uh, which is two different ways. Sometimes it's like this, which is like surrender before God. You'll see some priests doing this. Lord God, we pray. The orons, but, or you can do it. I, I prefer this way. It's like lifting up. The, I'm speaking the name of the community, the congregation. We're lifting up prayers. So it's like putting your prayers into my hands. I'm offering them to you. It's rooted in Judaism. It's the way Jews prayed. It's the way Jesus prayed. It's the way we pray. The posture of opening up offering up our prayers to God. And at the end, you know, we offer our prayers to God and the hands come in and we're offering it together through Christ our Lord. Amen. Then it shifts from, this is all just the, prepar- the preparatory rite takes place there. Then the liturgy of the word of God. The first, and there's, the two, there's two parts of the mass, liturgy of the word, liturgy of the Eucharist. So after the preparation rite, we go to the liturgy of the word of God. We now listen to God speaking to us through the scriptures. 
That goes back, as I said, to that synagogue service where people gather to hear the word of God and have it explained to them. In the scriptures, God is always speaking. No matter how many times you've heard the same passage, God is saying something fresh to you. It's the living word of God. So listen. I think I said at the last talk I gave, we have an Old Testament, a New Testament, and a gospel reading. Listen. If one thing resonates in your heart and one thing says something to you and you, you miss everything else said in liturgy of the word, that's great. The scripture is saying something to you. It may come in the first reading, second reading, gospel, I don't know, but it's a living word. God is, so listen to what God is saying to you. I always say God shouts in whispers. So listen to how God is whispering to you. The first reading is usually from the Old Testament. Often, the Old Testament reading is paired with the gospel. A lot of times, what you hear in the, the connection between the Old Testament story and the gospel story, not always, but usually, because the Old Testament prepares for Jesus. The Old Testament reading then is followed, or the first reading is followed by a responsorial psalm. You know, that first reading is God's word to us. The responsorial psalm is our word to God. That psalm response that, you know, the, 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 uh, the, the organist sings like the, the refrain and then we sing it and then the, she does the, 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 the verse and then we sing it. That's one of the 150 psalms, part of it. The psalms were Old Testament hymns that evoke or express different feelings, different emotions, different experiences in our relationship with God. And, and that responsorial psalm acts like a hinge that helps us transition from the Old Testament scriptures to the New Testament scriptures. The readings we do on Sunday are on a three-year cycle, cycle A, B, and C. So over three years, you're going to hear a nice cross-section of the Old Testament, you're going to hear a good chunk of the New Testament, and you're going to hear almost all of the Gospels. So. After the New Testament reading, which is usually something from St. Paul, the gospel is proclaimed. The deacon asks the priest for a blessing. He says, your, your blessing, he asks for it. And the priest says to him, may the Lord be on your lips and in your heart that you may proclaim his gospel worthily and, worthily and well in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then the, the deacon picks up this book, the book of the gospels, and he will, uh, if he hasn't carried it in and placed it on the altar, it'll be on the altar already. And then he holds it up while we sing this Alleluia. Alleluia means praise the Lord. Hebrew word, praise God, praise the Lord. We're about to hear the gospel of our salvation. So the book is held, the Alleluia sung. People assume a, 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 the stance of respect by standing up. The book is carried over to the, um, to the pulpit. And, and the gospel is, is read. Again, if you want to see this after, please feel free to stop up. We stand for the gospel, again, beginning with that acclamation that sings in praise of God, and we hear the story and the words of, of, that Jesus proclaimed. The gospel introduced by that official greeting for Mass, the Lord be with you. And then, what do we do? We, he announces the, a reading from the Holy Gospel according to, say, Matthew. And we do this. Or we do this. Don't do this. It means nothing. This means something. It's saying we want God's word to be emblazoned in our minds, to be spoken by our lips, and to be held in our heart so that it will be lived in our life. It's a rich sign, but again, I look out and I see, you know, that irritates me, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. I'll do it right. After the gospel, the deacon kisses the, the gospel book, recognizing the sacredness of the word of God and the awareness of the message just proclaimed. And then the homily is given, either by the deacon or by the priest. The homily breaks open God's word. And it applies the gospel to, to life. That's the purpose. Somebody once said the gospel should comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. It should make you uneasy. So don't tell a priest, good, 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 good homily, Father. Say, boy, that bothered me. It got me right here. 
you're talking to me. That's what we like to hear. That means we got through. We're not just here to, to say something nice. Now, every, again, there's not a pearl in every oyster. There's, you don't hit a home run every time you're at bat. So some homilies are better than others. But a homily is, a, is, is to challenge us to better lives, to be an image of the God that we're called to be. That's what a homily is supposed to do. It's not a time for teaching. You know, at a homily, I would love to talk about some of the things that I've given talks about in the past or what we're talking about today, but that's not the purpose of a homily. It's to show how the word of a God applies to our everyday life. Preaching is different than teaching. This is teaching. That's preaching. A perfect homily should speak to the head, the heart, and the hands. A perfect homily would say, boy, no, I, I did learn something new. I mean, maybe, maybe the priest talked about something about the way things were in the time of Jesus. or you know, I didn't know that about it. But it also should resonate. Does that resonate in your heart? You should, it should say something. You should be able to say, hey, that's me. That's me. The Lord Jesus is speaking to me. And it should, something, should say something to your hands. This is what I have to do about it. This is what I have. And even in a terrible homily, if, if, you, if you listen and, you know, and, and, and you're being honest, you should be able to hear something in here that says something to hear, what you need to do. Um, you know, uh, I like it when Deacon Tom preaches so that I can hear his insights. You know, I need to hear the word of God preach to me. I, I need to hear some, from someone else. So it's good that he preaches about every four weeks. Not just it gives me a break, but because I need to personally hear someone else reflect on the scriptures for me. I don't have a monopoly on this. I need to, to, to be preached to as well. After the homily, we have a brief, with the, the priest or deacon comes and sits down for a, a, a brief moment of silence to let what was said soak in. You should be doing something during that short pause. You shouldn't be, well, well, get out of here soon. That was. You're to be taking up that, sh that short brief moment, saying, what did I say? What did was said? What was God saying to me? And what, do I, what did it say to my heart? What did it say to my hands? Doing that in that short pause. Then we stand for the creed, okay? And the, we begin, I believe in one God. That's the creed. So that's the Nicene Creed. You know when that was written? 325. The year 320, it was written to, to formalize our understanding of God as one being in three persons. To formalize our, to put into statement form in a sense that God is a community of persons and we're made in that image. We're to be a community of, of, of people. We've been created to be like God, to be a, 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 a loving community as God himself is. So from the very beginning, right from the very beginning, Christians, you know, believe that, but the church never had an official formal statement of its core belief about God until 325 when they actually said, let's write this thing down. So we're all saying this, we're all making sure we have something in writing that is a statement of our, of our core belief. In the year 381, some things were added to it to further clarify the nature of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. But that prayer we say, that creed, that profession of our faith goes back into the, into the fourth century. A, the, the creed had, has been there. We've been saying that for 1,700 years. No reason to stop now. Sometimes, uh, we're, um, you know, we're also allowed to say the Apostles' Creed. I think Father John likes to shift from the Nicene Creed during Lent, I think. That's when we do the Apostles' Creed. Actually, the Apostles' Creed is older than the Nicene Creed. An earlier version of what later became called the Apostles' Creed was what was called the Old Roman Creed and was used as early as the second century. So what we now call the Apostles' Creed is kind of an enlargement of that old Roman Creed and is nearly identical to it. So whichever creed we use, the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, we are proclaiming together what we believe. We're proclaiming that we are in communion with each other in belief before we receive communion with each other in sacrament. Sometimes, you know, at, at Mass, like especially at Easter time or in the Feast of the Baptism of Jesus, we will renew our baptism. Rather than have the creed, we renew our baptism promises, which is 
a profession of faith in, in, the, in the Trinity. And so the, the priest will, will, will um, when we were baptized, we were asked three questions to which our godparents answered, I do. Well, we're adults, so that it's proper sometimes at Mass to answer those questions for ourselves. And so rather than say that long creed, we, we, we were posed a series of questions and we answer, I do. And then we're sprinkled with holy water. Uh, and so this, this uh, bowl would be filled with holy water. And um, this, there's a word for that, I forgot. Whisk broom? No. Well, aspergillum is a uh, more of a metal thing that holds it's a metal ball on the end, holds some holy water, a little sponge, and throws water. This thing, totally, you ever been hit with one of these things? <laughs> you know, you've been bad. If you've been baptized before, you're baptized. So, this throws a lot of water. But again, we are washed in water. We got to, it all began at our baptism when we're incorporated into the, into the risen Christ. And so, this helps us remind us how it all began the day we were baptized. And so, um, that's what will be sprinkled with holy water on certain days. That, 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 is, that is fitting. Then we say the universal prayers, or call the petitions. Uh, the, the deacon or the lecturer will do the petitions from there. there we start off, if you listen to those in their session, they're, they're, they're supposed to start off kind of generally. We pray for the whole church. We pray for the world. Then they kind of become more focused, more local. We pray for the, our nation. We pray for our leaders. We pray for the, the state. We pray for the sick. We pray for the dying. We pray for the dead. And we pray for the intention of the mass. Again, that goes back to the early days of the church. It's, they read that description. We, we, we pray for others. When that is finished, we take, we take the collection. So just as uh, you're supposed to participate in Mass by singing, you're supposed to participate in, in Mass by helping su support the church. And that's what the, the collection is. It's, it's, it's the financial, uh, taking respon financial responsibility for the, for the work of the parish, the work of the church. Then uh, we're just starting, by the way, to return to the offertory procession, bringing up the bread and wine. The, the, of course, COVID killed so many things uh, over the last couple of years, uh, but uh, I think Father John is starting to reintroduce that people will bring up the bread and wine. And then that goes back again to the early church when, when the, the congregation brought up the elements to be consecrated. So the bread and wine comes up, received by the priest and deacon, and the action moves to the altar. The liturgy of the word has ended. The liturgy of the Eucharist begins. The, what starts here is called the, the, the preparatory rite of it, or the preparation of the, of the gifts. The deacon prepares the altar. If you go to any church, you will see the first thing the deacon does is opens up what's called the corporal. It's a, it's a white cloth, a small cloth, but this big, that is put down first to catch any of the, the crumbs that come off a host, so they're not just you know, lost. Here at our church, we don't do that because already on the altar is a rather large corporal. It's called a corporal, it's a large cloth. So rather than trying to put this whole thing out and we have a microphone here, uh, we, we already have it in position. The, 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 it's called a corpora. It comes from the Latin word corpus, from corpus, which means body. And it's, it's a cloth in which the corpus, the body of, of Christ, will rest. The, the risen Christ will rest just as the body of Christ rested on a cloth in the tomb. But this is the corporal. It's to catch any of the, any of the, 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 the crumbs of the, of the host that may come off the plate. A saborium is um, the Latin word for bowl. That's, this would be a saborium. This would be a saborium. Just another, it's a Latin word for bowl. In it are small hosts that you receive at communion time. Father John prefers to use a large host like this, right? It often he uses, does he use a large one most of the time? No? Yes? Yeah. To, I, I prefer a medium-sized one like this. I think, Father, does Father Stock use this? Okay. Um, and on weekdays, we use something smaller. This breaks into, I don't know, maybe 50 pieces. This breaks into 24. This breaks into four. So 
whatever, whatever size, it's up to the, the priest to, uh, it's his preference, his preference. The saborium is placed on the altar. Only things that go on the altar, well, there's, there's three things that should be on an altar. First of all, um, the bread and wine. Second of all, the vessels that, that hold the bread and wine, the chalice, the ciborium, and the Roman Missal. This is the, 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 ideally, the priest, if the priest could memorize everything, he wouldn't need this, but people being people, we can't, we need help. This is our cheat sheet. So in any Catholic church in the world, there'd be this in the language of the people. It's the same in the, in the Roman Rite, in the Western Church. It's, this is the standard book at all masses. As I said, only the bread and wine, the vessels, and the book. There's no flowers, there's no candles, there's no cross on the altar. The altar is only for the holiest of things and the holiest of actions. So the, you'll see the deacon or the priest open up the book, and then we'll... Uh, the, the, The smaller bowls, which are for communion, um, you'll notice that we'll either use gold vessels or silver vessels. I'm not sure when we switch between the two. Father John, certain seasons he likes gold, some he likes silver, so they'll always match. So if these are the bowls for communion, they're put over here. The large ciborium for the priest will be in, in the center of the altar with the chalice with the wine in it. So let's say we're going to just use this one. The deacon, remember the priest is still over at the chair. The deacon is preparing all of this. The, the, the bread and wine are brought up by the servers given to the deacon. The, the deacon will put some wine in the chalice, and he'll put a little drop of water in the, in the chalice as well. The water and wine blend together. They become one. You can't separate them once they're, once they're mixed. They remind us that Jesus' divinity was inseparably mixed into our humanity in the incarnation. So when the deacon or priest puts the drop of water into the chalice, he says, by the mystery of this water and wine, May we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. So once the wine is prepared and the, and the, and the hosts are in, in the ciborium brought up here, the priest comes to the altar, the deacon presents him, the unconsecrated hosts, and the bread and wine are prepared, are prepared by blessing God. They're prepared by blessing God. You know, in the Catholic Church, we have two kinds of blessings. We bless things and people. For example, this is a book called, it's a book of blessings by the, by the church, official book. And in it are all kinds of blessings. There's blessings um, of people, like blessings of children, blessings of engaged couples, blessings of mothers before childbirth, uh, blessings for adopted children, bless, all kinds of stuff. There's also blessings for a gymnasium, blessing for a fishing boat, blessings for a, earth, for a seismograph, blessing of animals, motorcycles, cars, houses. We bless all kinds of, bless churches, bless Christmas trees, cemeteries, stations of the cross, bless an organ, bless bells. We bless people and things, and we bless God. We bless God. To bless God is to praise God. To bless God is to praise God. You know, uh, a Jewish blessing, and Jesus would know it very well, was called a, a barakah. Jan, you, you, some of you have seen The Chosen? If you watch any of The Chosen series, if you haven't seen that, by gosh, watch The Chosen. It's a series on the life of Jesus. But watch them. Before they eat, they say a little prayer they would say a barakah. They would say, blessed are you, Lord our God, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Blessed are you, God. Praise God. You bring forth bread for the earth. They, 
That's, that was their grace. That's how they would, they would praise God. The priest at this part of the Mass says a similar prayer. He says, Blessed are you, Lord our God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth, work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. And then you bless God when you say, Blessed be God forever. So we bless God for, for giving us this, 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 this bread from the earth. The priest blesses God. And then you bless God by saying, Blessed be God forever. So it's, it's, the, it's the priest and the community praising the Lord. Then, you know, uh, we, we turn to the wine. After we bless God, we bless God for what he has given us and for what God will give us. So the priest blesses God, you bless God. The Jewish blessing for wine would be, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has created the fruit of the vine. That's a Jewish blessing of wine. What does the priest say? Blessed are you, Lord our God, of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine, work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink, and you say, I bless God, you bless God, we bless God. Then comes uh, what's called the washing of the hands, or the lavabo. It, it comes from the early days of the church for a very practical reason. Any idea why the priest would wash his hands? This is, by the way, a very little water is placed on the hand, you know. But in the early day, years ago, they would just have a whole pitcher of water. And why, why would there be such a washing of the hands? Louder? Well, yes and no. For, for centuries, when people brought up bread and wine, they'd also bring up sheep and goats and chickens for the poor, food for the poor. And the priest received them and had to wash his hands because he, had to, he was about to touch sacred things. So it's a very practical reason. He got all yucky, so he had to wash before he did something sacred. So that was the purpose of the, of the washing. It's very symbolic now. It's, it's, it's really symbolic of the need of the priest to be made clean, to be made worthy to celebrate the liturgy. So the priest says, wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. We're all sinners. We're all not where we should be. And so the priest acknowledges that by praying that he can be washed clean of his sins. Then what happens? Everybody stands up, and the priest invites you to pray. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. And then you say, what? May the Lord accept his sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of all his holy church. Then the priest says a prayer over the gifts. It's kind of a bridge between the preparation of the gifts and the Eucharistic prayer. After, the, after that Eucharistic prayer, everyone, everyone stands for the Eucharistic prayer, which is, you know, the word Eucharist is a Greek word that means thanksgiving. We, we're here to give thanks to God. It begin, the Eucharistic prayer, which is really a consecratory prayer, it, be, it, starts, it begins with a preface dialogue and it goes to the, to the great amen. The preface dialogue goes back and forth. The priest says, the Lord be with you, and you say, and with your spirit. You're saying, may the spirit of God be in, may the spirit of God be in your spirit, in the core of your being, in the depth of your heart. That's what you're wishing to me, or you're praying for me. May the spirit of God be within, within, within your, your, the core of your heart. Then he says, lift up your hearts. You say, we, we lift them up to the Lord. And he says, let us give thanks, let us, let us give Eucharist, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And you say, it is right, it is just understood to give him thanks and praise. That's the, the dialogue. Goes, and then he says the preface. And the preface offers prayer, offers praise and thanksgiving to God and tells of the wonderful acts of God throughout history and in our lives. And it gives thanks for all of these things. And the preface ends with the, with the holy, holy, holy. Now, that comes from the scripture. If you read the, Acts of the, uh, read the book of Revelation, 
the, the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation has a picture where angels sing this as they surround God's throne and where they give God glory. They're singing, holy, holy, holy Lord. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the heavenly hymn in the presence of God. It's a picture of what's to come for God's faithful people. And so when we sing it, we're praying that it happens to us as well. And then, and when the holy, holy is finished, when it's, the song is finished, everyone falls to their knees. We kneel before God as he's about to become sacramentally present on the altar. And then the priest begins Eucharistic prayer with his orans position, either this way or this way. As he offers, he lifts up the church's prayer of praise and thanksgiving. He's lifting up your prayers and, and praise. That's what this symbol means. There are four main Eucharistic prayers, and they're called one, two, three, and four. Okay? Simple. The first Eucharistic prayer is the longest, and it was promulgated by Pope Gregory the Great way back in the sixth century. And it's based on an ancient Eucharistic prayer probably dating back at least into the 400s, 400 AD. That's the first Eucharistic prayer. The, the second Eucharistic prayer is the shortest. One is the longest, number two is the shortest, and is most probably based on, on, a, on a third century Eucharistic prayer of St. Hippolytus of Rome. He lived like about the year 130 to around 235. And he said this Eucharistic prayer, he said that, that this Eucharistic prayer of his was not his invention, but it was a prayer that he had heard, that he had received, which means it was older than he was, though he probably you know, reworked it a bit from its earlier source. The third Eucharistic prayer is longer than the second, and the fourth one is, is, uh, you know, is long like the first one. Now, there's a couple other ones they use, one for reconciliation, one, there's like three or four we use occasionally. But those, those one, two, three, and four are, the, are pretty much the one we'll, we'll use here. Normally, you'll hear on Sunday, either we use number two or number three. The oldest one is the shortest one, the second Eucharistic prayer by Hippolytus. All others were kind of developed from that over the years. I usually use number two, not because it's the shortest, but because it's the oldest, and also because I held it in my hands. A number of years ago, I, I was uh, visiting a priest friend of mine in Verona, Italy, and as he was showing me around his cathedral, and right next to it was the diocesan archives. And I said to him, I said, isn't the apostolic uh, tradition of Hippolytus in your archives? And he said, yeah. I said, any way I could see it? Oh, sure. So he knew the archivist. He invited me in, went into this huge room full of dusty old books that are, you know, like 1,500 years old, 1,800 years old. And he asked for the apostolic tradition of Hippolytus. He brought it out. I have, I have a picture of it on my iPad. If you want to see it, I can show it to you after we're done here. But I, again, I feel special closeness to that second Eucharistic prayer since I actually held the document in my hands a number of years ago. It, meant, it still means a lot to me. I said there are four main prayers and a couple of other ones. They all begin by acknowledging the holiness of God. They all thank God for his abundant gifts, especially the gift of salvation in Christ. They all call down the Holy Spirit on his faithful people that they may be unified and, and become a living, sacrifice, living offering to God. They all, we all, all those Eucharistic prayers pray for the living and the dead. They pray for the, leader of the leaders of the church and all of the faithful and all of and the whole world. And every one of them in the middle or somewhere in, this, in the center narrates what Jesus did at the last supper he ate with his disciples the night before he died. That's what's called the institution narrative. They all use the same words of what Jesus did at the last supper. At the beginning of the institution narrative, in other words, the words of consecration, you know, what, what, what does the priest do? He puts his hands like this. It's called epiclesis. It's a Greek word that means invocation. At, at the epiclesis, the, the priest extends his hands down over the bread and wine as he invokes on the Holy Spirit, calls on the Holy Spirit to descend on the bread and wine and transform them from ordinary bread and wine into the risen body and blood of Christ. 
That's what that symbol is. It's calling down the Holy Spirit. His hands reflect the words. He calls upon God to send down the Holy Spirit on these simple gifts to make them sacred. And again, the sign of the cross. The priest then speaks in the name of Jesus and the power of Jesus as he speaks the words of Jesus spoken at the Last Supper. And by the power of these words spoken by one ordained to speak in Jesus' name, God changes the bread and wine into the presence of the risen Christ. The priest does not do it. The priest consecrates nothing. It is Jesus who does it. Jesus uses the priest to consecrate. We talk about the priest consecrating bread and wine. No, it's God's doing it. God's, but he uses the ministry of the priest to change bread and wine into his risen son's presence. The words of institution state what Jesus did the night before he died. And after he states, this is my body or this is my blood, the priest says this not on his own, but in the name of Jesus and the person of Jesus. Then he holds the consecrated bread or the consecrated wine up before us. We ring some bells, some churches do, some churches don't. This is, we're holding before us what just happened, this God awesome miracle. Then the priest genuflects or bows before the sacrament. They are now the body and blood of Christ himself. The consecration, they, I mean, the congregation is then invited to proclaim the mystery of faith. It's also called the memorial acclamation. The priest says the mystery of faith. And you say either, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. Or you say, when we, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, uh, we, we, we proclaim your death till you come again. Or you say, save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection, you have set us free. These are short little acclamations. We proclaim Jesus' promise of eternal life and that God is not dead but fully alive. And because he lives, we share in the hope of eternal life. And then the rest of the Eucharistic prayer is prayed. And at the end, the Son of God is lifted up and a doxology is sung. Through him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. A doxology gives praise to God, often through the Father, to the Father, through, with, and in Jesus, in union with the Holy Spirit. So a doxology often praises the Trinity. If the liturgy was a piece of music, this would be the crescendo. It's the high point. We call it the great amen. So the priest lifts it up, full-blown organ comes in, and we, and the, we, and we sing. The, the, congr the community responds by singing with great joy and solemnity, amen, to what has been proclaimed. It's called the great, you know, the word amen means I believe. It means so be it. It means it is. It means right on. It means I believe. So sing it. Sing it loudly. Sing it proudly. The liturgy of the Eucharist ends and the communion rite begins. We acknowledge we are God's family by praying to God who is our Father. And the priest, you know, puts the Oran's position. We say the Lord's Prayer. You're invited to join the Lord in the Oran's position. A very ancient prayer from, if you want. It's up to you. No one says you have to. The priest <clears throat> continues with, you know, the, the prayer that says, you know, deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you say, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Now, we say it that way. Many Protestants stick that at the end of the Our Father, right? The earliest copies of the Gospels do not contain, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, which is a form of doxology. In the early church, Christians living in the eastern part of the Roman Empire 
did add that to the doxology, but never became popular in the Western part, in the, in the Roman rite of the church. It wasn't until the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century that the Church of England, you know, trying to rid itself of all vestiges of Catholicism, added that doxology onto the Our Father. And their version became kind of the standard for English-speaking Protestants. But biblically speaking, it's just not there. Then after that, that there's one other little prayer we say, the priest says, and then the community is invited to share a sign of peace. <coughs> the sign of peace is not a time to say hello. It's not a time to wish someone Merry Christmas. It's not a time to say have a nice day. The purpose of the sign of peace is to bring to mind where and with whom we are not at peace in our life. It's based on Jesus' command. He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and you remember you have something against your brother or sister, leave your gift. Go be reconciled. Then come and bring your gift to the altar. It's based on that. Think about it. Think about if there's anyone with whom we're not at peace. We should think, is there anyone to whom we hold a grudge? Is there anyone we haven't forgiven? Before we receive communion, we need to say to God, help me come to peace with that individual. To share a sign of peace, whether it's a handshake or an embrace or a kiss, is to say, I'm going to make a concerted effort to reconcile with people I've offended or people who have offended me. I think this is perhaps the most difficult and demanding part of the Mass. We just kind of blow it off. It's not, peace be with you. Peace. No, think what you're saying. You're committing yourself to want to be reconciled with anyone to whom you're not at peace. We are willing to promise to do to others what Jesus has done to us. As Jesus has offered his peace and forgiveness of us, we must commit ourselves to offer to those around us before we approach him in Holy Communion. I said, it's, I think it's the most difficult and demanding part of the Mass. But, but to be honest, working towards peace and forgiveness doesn't happen overnight. You know, it's a process. You've got to work at it. But it begins with making a decision, making a commitment. And that's what we're doing at that sign of peace. It may be tough. It may take a while. But you know, they say a, what, a journey of a thousand miles starts at one step. So... Next time you're at Mass, take that one step with that sign of peace and see where you need to be reconciled. Then comes what's called the fraction rite, or the breaking of the bread. Remember I said that one of the earliest names for the Mass is the breaking of the bread. So the consecrated bread is broken as a sign of the body of Christ, which is broken for us so our sins could, could be forgiven. And then a small piece of the host is put in the chalice, representing the body and blood of Jesus shed for us. It's easy to miss that, but I ask you, next time at Mass, watch for it. It goes quickly, takes a little piece of the hoe, drops it in there. You know where that started? It goes back to an ancient practice that began years ago, centuries ago, in the city of Rome. In the early days of the church, each day, the Bishop of Rome, who eventually became called the Pope, would celebrate Mass at a different place within, his, within the city. And all the priests in that neighborhood, or someone designated or delegated from a parish, would come to, that, to, the, to the Bishop's Mass, the Pope's Mass, as a sign of their unity with the Bishop of Rome around the table of the Lord. And after Mass was over, they would take a small piece of the host consecrated by the Pope, and before they, when they would leave, they would take that little piece of host back to their, to their own church. And later in the day, they would celebrate Mass for the people in that neighborhood or in that area or in that parish. And just before Holy Communion, to show their unity that they had with the, with the Bishop of Rome, they dropped that little piece into the plate, into the, into the uh, ciborium, or into the, into the chalice. That was a tradition. It was a part of the people of Rome, and they all understood what, what, what they were doing. It was part of their liturgy. 
later on, as pilgrims came to Rome and they watched what the Pope was doing, what the people were doing, they took that practice home with them. And so before communion, the priest would take a little piece of host and drop it in there. But the original meaning and significance was lost. That is to show the unity with the Bishop of Rome. So they, became, so they began to develop kind of an ag, uh, allegorical understanding of what we say today. The priest says, may the mingling of the body and blood of Christ bring us to eternal life. So when you say the priest do this, puts a little bit of host in that cup, you can see it as a unity, as a sign of our unity with the Holy Father, as well as seeing the Holy Communion as food that brings us to the hope of eternal life. So again, a little bit of information there. While this is going on, the deacon retrieves hosts from the tabernacle that were not consumed at the previous liturgy as the Lamb of God is sung. The Lamb of God. John the Baptist's words when he pointed out to Jesus. And he said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin. That's what John yelled at these people. There he is. We sing that. I think we should shout it. So next time at Mass, don't tell Father John I said this, but do it at his Mass. You say, the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God. That's what's going on. We, we sing it. We should shout it. We're pointing it and say, this is the Lamb of God. This is the presence of God. This is Jesus the Lamb. Then, when that's over, the priest genuflects or bows, recognizing Christ's presence in the consecrated bread and wine, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's, that comes from you know, Matthew's Gospel, the 8th chapter, the 8th verse. Remember when the centurion asked Jesus to heal his servant? He says, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. Say the word, my servant will be healed. Well, we, we, we take that guy's words and we adopt them and adapt them for ourselves. Say but the word that my soul will be healed. I'm not worthy. Heal me, Lord. Heal my heart. Heal my hurts. Heal my angers. Heal my prejudice. We're asking for that healing. We make the words of the scriptures our own, stating we're not worthy to receive Jesus. We are broken, and we ask God to make us whole and to make us holy. And then we receive communion. What do you think is the verb for receiving Holy Communion? We say, well, we'll receive communion. There's a verb, though. You know what it is? It's obvious. Communicate. The word for receiving communion is say, we, we communicate. We communicate with God. We are in communion with God. We, we should receive communion under both species, bread and wine. It's the full, now, he's, Jesus is fully present in the bread. He's fully present in the, in the, in the consecrated wine. Obviously, because of COVID, that's not going to be possible probably for another generation until we're all dead. That's what that means. But it's bread alone, wine alone. The fullest sign is together. You know, uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem was a, a bishop of Jerusalem around the year, the middle of three, the year 300. He wrote this. He said this, in approaching at for communion, come not with your fingers spread, but with your left hand a throne for your right, as for that which is to receive a king. And having hollowed your hand, receive the body of Christ, saying over it, Amen. So then, after having hollowed your eyes by the touch of the holy body, partake of it giving heed lest you lose any portion thereof. For whatever you lose is evidently a loss to you, as it were from one of your own members. For tell me, if anyone gave you grains of gold, would you not hold them with all carefulness, being on your guard against losing any of them and suffering a loss? Will you not then much more closely keep watch so that not a crumb falls from your hand of what is more precious than gold and precious stones. Then after you have partaken of the body of Christ, draw near also to the cup of his blood, not stretching out your hands, but bending and saying with an air of worship and reverence, Amen. Hollow yourself by partaking of the blood of Christ. 
in the Roman rite to which we belong, you can receive communion in the hand or on the tongue. If you receive in the hand, if you're, if you're right-handed, you, you, put your left, you put your right hand under your left. And the priest or the Eucharistic minister, the deacon says, the body of Christ. And you, 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 he said, make a throne. So you shouldn't go like this, because the priest has to put into, and he touches your hand. It should be flat or like this. Hold it up and you say amen. Some people don't say amen. I would say the body of Christ. No, you believe it. Say amen, say it. And then you step to the side, you reach up, and receive. If you're, if, you're left, if you're left-handed, the left hand goes on the bottom. Some people, as I said, it's your choice to re receive on the hand or on the tongue. Uh, some people prefer the tongue, it, it's their option um, because they feel they're not worthy to receive God in the hand. I, I don't, no matter what you receive in the hand or the tongue, we're all unworthy. Uh, to me, it's, it's you know, but it's, it's your choice. I've always thought it interesting that um, I wonder if we commit more sins, what we do with our hands or what we say with our mouth. I don't know. Answer for yourself. Um, but again, it's the person's choice, and it's either way is perfectly fine. It's their option. Then we remember at communion, there's a song being sung, a hymn being proclaimed, praise being offered. We should be singing as we come forward, or at least if you don't have the book, when you get back to your seat. We are uniting ourselves as a community to Jesus and to one another. So when you get back to your seat, pick up the songbook, sing. We, we, as a community, we, we receive the body of Christ. Should we, we should sing as a community as we receive the body of Christ. And by the way, there are, uh, I think there are some people in our parish who, have, who are gluten intolerant. They have what celiac disease. Uh, if, if you know someone who has that and they don't want to come to communion, please tell them we are prepared for that. They should just come in the sacristy 15 minutes before Mass. Don't come the last minute and tell us. And we have a special host that we can use at Mass that is, that is gluten-free. And we'll put it in a special uh, pix so it won't be touching any of the other hosts. And just make sure they come to the priest and we'll give them that special uh, no-gluten host. So if you know someone who's uh, gluten intolerant, tell them to uh, let us know. After communion, the deacon consolidates the host, puts them into, uh, into uh, one of these, and puts it back in the tabernacle. Those hosts that are reserved in the tabernacle, where you take them when someone's sick uh, at home or in the hospital, if someone is dying, we take them for the anointing of the sick. So they're used. Uh, uh, we don't have tons of them in there, but we should try to use them at mass. Then after the tabernacle is closed, we sit down, you sit down. That's when the time to make your thanksgiving. You want to put your hand in your heads or just close your eyes? What did you just communicate with God? The risen Christ has come to you. Say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We've just been intimate with God. So close your eyes and be with God with whom you've communicated and give God thanks. After that little pause there, we stand up. There's a, there's a closing prayer. And that the closing prayer summarizes what we've just done. And it asks for a particular grace that will, that will remain with us. So listen to it again. It's twofold. We summarize what we've just done and we ask for for something. The priest then gives a blessing and asks God to bless the community. Sometimes it's a solemn blessing, but it has like three invocations. And the Mass kind of ends where it started, with the sign of the cross. Then comes the dismissal. You know, um, do you ever notice what those dismissals at the end of Mass have in common? There are three of them we can use, or a variation thereof. We say, go for, the deacon would say, or the priest would say, go forth, the Mass is ended. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. What's in common with all of those? The word go. Go. We've been nourished by the word of God. We've been fed by the bread of life. Now go. And take Jesus to a, a world starving to know his presence, to know his, to know his peace, to know his love. The Mass 
ends with a commission. It ends with a charge. It ends with homework. Go out and change a little part of the world in which you live. Make it a holy place. Make it God's place. So the mass ends where it begins then, comes up, kisses the altar. The deacon and priest leave, led by the cross, following the cross, as the congregation sings. This time, the closing hymn is a sing of sending, a sing of dismissal. That's, that's the Roman liturgy. And anywhere you go in the world, you're going to see the same thing. Different language, maybe done a little more, maybe better than, in some places than in others, but the structure of that liturgy goes back to the very beginning. We've added to it. We've subtracted a little bit from it. All of it's secondary stuff, but its essence is what we do. Uh, if you want to take a look at some of the vestments we use, uh, the priest always puts on uh, what's called an alb. It's like a baptismal garment. reminds him of his baptism when he came into the church. This always is liturgical underwear. So this goes first. And we have liturgical colors. The green is during ordinary time, which is about six months of the year. So you'll see different shades of green. Father John actually has uh, the green to match the flowers or the, the grass. So it's, it's, it can be kind of a, a lighter green in the spring and a darker green in the, and in the summer and then in the fall is kind of you know, a t autumnal green. And there's, there's gold for you know, special fee Christmas, Easter, Lottie of Christ, kind of there's different, different colors, red for a feast of Pentecost or the feast of a martyr, um, purple for Advent or for Lent, but uh, there's some, some very lovely vestments you wear, and uh, so if you want to see them or if you want to see you behind the scenes, please let me know, I'll give you a tour. So, any questions? I went way too long, I apologize for that. I did say, remember, the mind can absorb, but the sea can endure, so your minds have absorbed a lot because I went too long. So, any questions or, yeah. I have one question. At the end of Mass, after communion, you, you just indicated that we should go back to our seat and sing, sing the, the hymn. Yep. After, while communion is going on, it's, remember, it's a communal action. The community should be singing. So, rather than going back and isolating yourself with your private Thanksgiving, you should be joining in what the community is doing, joining in song. When the song is over, we all sit down, and again, then that's a time for, for private prayer, time for private thanksgiving. But please, if, if at all possible, take advantage of that chance that, that, that singing with the community. It's a sign of the communal action by a community as we communicate. So. Well, at 7.30 Mass. 7.30 Mass, on, it's, it's the quiet Mass. We don't have, then you just do what you want if we're not singing. Yeah. Yeah, the question is is there's some confusion about when you come back, should you be kneeling, should you be sitting? When do you sit? Would you sit when you after you receive communion, when the, when the tabernacle's closed and the priest sits down, uh, Father John has kind of, he just wishes we all do it the same way as we should. And it's pretty much, I think he says, when the priest sits, the congregation sits. So we're all doing the same thing at the same time. Now, obviously, if someone has got, you know, some ailment and you can't stand, you've got back problems, you, you, you sit. You, mean, it's not a, you don't have to, but... The ideal is sing when the community sings, sit when the community sits, kneel when the community kneels, you know, bless yourself when the community bless itself. We're doing this together. It's public worship. It's communal worship. Okay, I've kept you way too long. Thank you so much, everybody, and uh, that's it. Um, go home.
Okay, so it's just a square so that you know that it's in there. Some, some uh, altar stones are much larger. This one 